Do you know why the marigold flower is orange in color? Welcome to your own favorite learning channel ADP for Learning. My name is Ashish. Today we will learn about the chemistry of flower color. As you can see this marigold flower is orange. So a question may come to your mind. What does it mean to be the color orange? The answer lies in the fact that when light energy interacts with the molecules in both the flower and our eyes, we perceive color. To truly understand the concept of color we must first understand the concept of light. So, in other words, color is a property of light. We are surrounded by charged particles. The way these charged particles attract and repel each other is called the electric field. The way these charged particles interact when they are in motion is called the magnetic field. Together, the two fields make up what's called the electromagnetic field. As shown in the figure when a photon travels, it creates waves in the electromagnetic field. Light is energy that is traveling through the electromagnetic field. Light is interesting because it behaves both like a particle and a wave. The particle part of light is called a photon. Individual photons can vary in how much energy they carry. Light is also a wave because, as a photon travels, it creates waves in the electromagnetic field. The amount of energy an individual photon carries affects the shape of the waves it creates. The distance between each ripple in the waves is called wavelength. As shown in the figure, if the photon has a lot of energy, the ripples will be closer together, that is, the wavelength will be shorter. If the photon has less energy, the wavelength it creates will be longer. So, a question may come to your mind what happens when light hits a molecule. As we all know molecules are made of atoms. Electrons and atoms tend towards their lowest possible energy state. They try to be as close as possible to the nucleus. The further away an electron is from the nucleus, the higher energy it is, just like when you stretch a rubber band. When an atom comes near another atom, their electron shells interact. The electrons move to position themselves to exist at their lowest possible energy. Often achieving this state requires that the atoms share electrons in their shells. This is how atoms become bonded to each other and form molecules. Atoms and molecules are always in motion, vibrating and rotating around their molecular bonds. The more a molecule vibrates, the higher its energy level. A molecule is also rarely alone, so its energy level is also affected by the other molecules in its surrounding environment. When a photon hit a molecule, what happens next depends on two things. First, the amount of energy the photon carries that is its wavelength, and second, the molecule's overall energy level that is how much it is moving. If the photon energy level is higher than the energy in the molecule, the photon will be absorbed by the molecule's atoms. That is, the energy of the photon will be transferred to the atoms in the molecule, making them vibrate, move or rotate. If the photon energy level is lower than the molecule's energy level, the photon will not be absorbed but will instead be reflected. That is, the photon energy will not be accepted by the atoms. The energy will be turned away. As shown in figure we can see the petals of our flower are made of molecules which are made of atoms. Electrons exist in shells around each atom's nucleus. When two atoms share electrons they become bonded. Also, the figure represents when a photon with enough energy hits an atom, the energy from the photon is absorbed by the atom's electrons causing them to jump to a shell further from the nucleus. Since this excited state isn't stable, the electron quickly jumps back down to its previous position. So that may lead to another question how do our eyes detect color? As we all know, the sun produces light at all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, but most sunlight that reaches the surface of the earth is within the visible range. Wavelength measured here in nanometers nm. When we look at an object, we are experiencing the unique photon signature that the object's molecules are absorbing and reflecting. We see a molecule as colored when the object absorbs light at a wavelength that matches some wavelength in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If a molecule absorbs blue light, the object reflects orange light, and we see the object as orange. For all animals, the ability to perceive the color of objects relies on just one molecule, retinol. This molecule is extremely reactive to photons because it contains several double bonds with high-energy electrons. As shown in the figure, the retinal molecule changes shape when it absorbs a photon. Retinal that is on its own not bound to opsin protein absorbs photons between 370 and 380 nanometers. Also, as shown in the figure molecules in the marigold flower's petals absorb photons with wavelengths between 400 to 500 nanometers. 
wavelengths in the visible range longer than that that is, those that have lower energy are reflected. Retinol is bound to opsin, the first protein in a signaling cascade that tells the brain a certain light wavelength has been detected, which our brain perceives as color. Slightly different versions of the opsin protein can respond to photons with specific wavelengths. Through very minor chemical changes, an opsin can tweak the photon sensitivity of its resident retinal molecule. Scientists call this spectral tuning. As shown in figure, retinal molecules are tucked inside opsin proteins. Slight amino acid variations in the opsin protein can change the stability of the retinal molecule. The less stable retinal is, the more its reactivity is shifted towards shorter wavelengths in the spectrum that is blue. It is important to note that in humans there are three kinds of opsins that respond to a different range of light wavelengths ranging between 390 and 700 nanometers. Like humans, honeybees also have three kinds of color-detecting opsins, but they're tuned to a different range of wavelengths. Bees can detect wavelengths between 300 and 650 nanometers. This means they can see ultraviolet light, UV, but not the color red. Hummingbirds have four color-detecting opsins stretching their range of detectable wavelengths into the 370 to 700 nanometers range. This means they can see both UV and the color red. As shown in the figure, humans, honeybees and hummingbirds have opsin proteins with varying sensitivities to different light wavelengths thanks to spectral tuning. So, a related question may come to your mind why do all eyes use opsin proteins and retinal molecules to detect light? The answer lies in the fact that the variety of eyes found throughout the animal kingdom, evolutionary biologists once thought eyes had evolved independently dozens or even hundreds of times. But thanks to DNA sequencing and other molecular tools, we know today that modern eyes are built from many of the same genes. Ancient, toolkit, genes such as opsins, pax, and OTX first evolved in a primitive ancestor that gave rise to all animals with eyes. These genes have been preserved throughout evolution, and today we still find them at work in all types of eyes. The diversity of modern animal eyes is the result of refinements and specializations built on top of this basic genetic framework. Not all eye features are built using the same genes. Lenses, for example, are refinements that arose when different genes were recruited to perform a similar task in different organisms. Similarly, shielding pigments arose from a variety of genes. Molecular analysis has shown that many genes in the eye, whether shared among organisms or not, had other functions first. They were later recruited to take on second jobs. Now coming back to the topic of all eyes use opsins. Opsins detect light. Before being recruited into the eye, opsins had a variety of other jobs. In modern organisms that don't have eyes, such as archaea, fungi, green algae, protists, and simple animals, members of the opsin family act as ion pumps, sensory molecules, light-gated ion channels, and circadian rhythm regulators. Light-detecting opsins had to evolve only once. The thousand or more modern animal opsins are all modified versions of one that was present in a shared ancestor that lived more than 600 million years ago. As shown in the figure, different opsins detect a variety of intensities and wavelengths of light. Many species have multiple opsins, allowing them to see a broad range of wavelengths, thus forming the basis of color vision. Each animal's opsins are tuned to the wavelengths of light that are most important to its lifestyle and environment. In reality, there are genes that act as universal regulators. For eyes to function properly, many different proteins must interact. PAX proteins are regulators. They attach directly to the DNA and turn on the necessary genes in the right place at the right time. As shown in the figure, defects in the PAX6 gene cause the loss of eye structures in humans, mice, and fruit flies. These regulators perform similar jobs in animals as diverse as insects and vertebrates, so they must have evolved before the two lineages split. In fact, nearly every animal that grows eyes does so with the help of PAX genes. Even organisms without eyes, such as sponges, have PAX genes. This finding suggests that PAX proteins originally controlled other processes and were later recruited into the eye. In the mid-1990s, researchers were surprised to discover that fruit flies, mice, and humans who were born missing eye structures had defects in the same gene. This gene, called PAX6 or eyeless in flies, is required for normal eye development in all animals with bilateral symmetry. Even in eyes that look very different, PAX6 functions in much the same way. When placed in a fly, the mouse PAX6 gene activates all the genes necessary to form a normal, 
functional fly eye but not a mouse eye. Also, crystalline proteins that make up the lens and cornea have diverse origins. These crystalline proteins are tightly packed into a nearly crystal array and make up the lens and cornea, the transparent light-gathering structures in many types of eyes. While all crystallines share many features that is they're water-soluble, transparent, and stable at high concentrations, also they have an enormously diverse evolutionary history. Different crystallines have evolved independently from a broad assortment of stress proteins and metabolic enzymes. In some animals, crystallines participate in a type of job sharing. At low concentrations in other parts of the body, they still carry out their original stress or metabolic roles. In other animals, the original gene has been duplicated. One copy still does its old job while the other copy has been modified by natural selection into a high-performing lens protein. This theme of duplication and divergence is common throughout evolution. Not only do diverse crystallines act alike, but they are also controlled by the same regulatory genes that is regulatory switches where PAX proteins can attach have evolved independently in front of unrelated crystalline genes. As shown in the figure, you can easily see the role of duplication and divergence between human and ducks. Also, you have seen many shielding pigments that come in many different forms. Many pigments that provide shielding in the eye also color other parts of the body. For example, tiger fur, elephant skin, red blood cells, peacock feathers, spider body, snake scales, moth scales, and dog fur. In simple eyes, dark pigments shield the photoreceptors, giving tiny, transparent animals more information about light direction. In more complex eyes, pigments absorb light after it passes through photoreceptors, preventing it from scattering and degrading image quality, as well as from damaging sensitive tissues. A wide variety of dark-colored molecules act as shielding pigments in different types of eyes, and many eyes contain more than one type of pigment. Common eye pigments include melanin that is in vertebrates, cnidaria, planaria, and some nematodes, omochromes that is in mollusks and arthropods, terans, guanidine, and hemoglobin. As with crystallines, many genes involved in pigment production are also active in other parts of the body, melanins color skin, fur, and feathers. Terrans color butterfly scales, omochromes color spiders' bodies, hemoglobin transports oxygen in the blood. Now coming back to our original topic of biological pigments in plants. Many plants exploit chemistry to make use of the phenomenon of color. The earliest pigment molecules were probably used by primitive bacteria about 3.4 million years ago. These bacteria used their pigment molecules to harvest energy from photons to power chemical reactions. This is the process of photosynthesis. These early bacteria are believed to have harvested infrared wavelength light. Today, plants with the pigment molecule chlorophyll use photosynthesis to generate energy from light wavelengths in the visible range. Over time these pigments evolved to also attract pollinators. The two most common pigments are carotenoids and anthocyanins. First, we will see the carotenoids. The petals in our marigold flower contain a large amount of carotenoid pigment molecules. Carotenoids are made of long chains of alternating single and double bonds. For example, as shown in the figure, beta-carotene has 11 alternating double and single bonds resulting in delocalized electrons that make the molecule highly reactive to photons. Molecules generally need at least 8 of these kinds of bonds to produce visible color. Because of these bonds, the atoms that make up these chains share electron shells all along the length of the chain. This makes the electrons highly reactive to photons. There are over 700 known naturally occurring carotenoids. Variations in the length of the molecules shift the range of photon wavelengths that are absorbed. The longer the chain, the longer photon wavelengths the molecule can absorb. As shown in the figure many flowers are colored by carotenoid pigments. For example, from left to right yellow monkey flower, California poppy, daffodil, and sunflower. Do you know that the same carotenoid pigment molecule which we are discussing is responsible for the flower's color, and at the same time is also responsible for our ability to perceive the flower's color? You will be surprised to know that retinol comes from eating carotenoids that is vitamin A is an essential nutrient we get from eating foods with carotenoids like papaya, mango, and cantaloupe. For instance, when we eat the carotenoid beta-carotene, it is broken in half to form two molecules of vitamin A. Each vitamin A molecule is then converted into retinol. So in this way, the same pigment molecule responsible for creating our flower's color is also responsible for our ability to perceive the flower's color. The second molecule or pigments in flowers, 
called anthocyanins, also produce color because of alternating double and single bonds, but with a different structure based on rings. Anthocyanins are unstable compounds. Conditions like temperature, interaction with other molecules, and pH can all alter the structure of anthocyanins. Some flowers keep their anthocyanins in vacuoles with a certain pH to ensure their stability. Others stabilize them by forming elaborate stacks with other flavonoid pigments for example flavones, flavanols, and metal ions, like iron and magnesium. This instability is why it has been so difficult for horticulturists to create blue versions of flowers and also perhaps why blue flowers are less common in nature than flowers with other colors. As shown in the figure, increasing the number of hydroxyl groups that is OH on the anthocyanin molecule shifts its visible color from red to blue. Flowers from left to right, red geranium, stokes aster, and delphinium clearly show these shifts. At last, there are various biological pigment concentrations and combinations that may lead to different color appearances in flowers. For example, as shown in the figure the color of these scarlet monkey flowers results from different combinations of biological pigments. That is in other words, flowers come in a wide range of hues and colors. Altering the number of carotenoids results in different hues of yellow, orange, or red. Altering the amount of anthocyanin can result in different hues of red, purple, or blue. Further nuances in flower color can be achieved with different concentrations of both types of pigment. Thank you for joining with me for the amazing journey of learning. In the future, we will again meet with other new, innovative topics. Meanwhile, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and comment.